I'm Christian psychologist Dominic Herbst, and I'm continuing with session two of season two in the training of understanding how to recover the healing with, between parents and their children. Now, I'm going to make a commentary on this before I continue, and that is that session one, the first part of this two-part series, addressed the marital healing uh, of season two between husband and wife that followed, of course, the journey of season one, which is zero to 18 years of age. So the part that we're going to talk about now is between father and son, father and daughter, mother and son, mother and daughter. Now, there may be those that would desire just to have this segment for their understanding. However, it's very important that you and I understand that whatever happened in our marriage before our healing had every bit of effect on the way we parented as the father and the mother, on the impact of the pain that our children experience during those years of conflict and those years prior to walking the journey of season one. Therefore, the presentation that we're doing here will be without setting the foundation that I put forth in the first part of this series. I'm not going to rediscuss that. That is why it's essential, if you're listening to this now, that you heard part one. If you skipped to part two because you have the opportunity to skip ahead, if you just are looking for the healing uh, between you and your child. Maybe there was a divorce. Maybe uh, you and your spouse had conflict in the early part of child rearing. Uh, all fine reasons to go through this part of it. You will miss some very, very key elements as to what we're trying to show you here if you don't watch the foundation of part one of this series. So I appreciate you understanding that as we continue. Now, the reason why it's important for us to complete season one as a parent is because we will not see many of the methods that we used in parenting that may have hurt our children, maybe taking their value or dignity, maybe words that echoed off the walls of our heart from maybe what our dad said to us, our mother may have said to us, and that continued in the generational iniquity you see, that's why generational iniquities have so much power over us, because we are condemned or consigned to repeat what we do not heal. So what we find ourselves doing are the very things that we didn't want done to us, and the very things that we promised we wouldn't do as a result of the experience that we had as a child. And that's why it's so important to break the power of what happened in our early years. You remember, and this is a bit of a review, that God likes to heal in sequence. In other words, those things that occurred long ago in our lives, from the very beginning of our lives, have a greater impact on what's happening today than almost anything else. And many have come to me at our encounters in small group and uh, personal individual counseling and said, well, my problem right now is between my son and I, or my daughter and I, and I want you to just help me with that, and we make it very clear that we cannot be effective in helping you to speak to your child from your heart for healing until your heart has been freed from the bondage of the bitterness and the pain that you experienced from the offenses that you went through as a child. So that's why season one is so important. The next thing is, because we bring forth truth from the inward parts, not only does the Lord bring in healing at that place of pain, He brings with it wisdom and discernment so that you, you will see things about yourself going through season one that you will see reflective in your child. You will have an understanding of what your child is experience, experiencing based upon what you experienced when you wrote your autobiography, when you confronted your mom or dad in that letter of confrontation. That's why it's so very important that you and I have walked through season one in order to be effective here in season two with our children. There are those that say, well, just give me the script. If you just tell me what words to say and how to say it, 
then maybe my child will begin to respond. And the way uh, I respond to that is that no matter how well we could script it, maybe in a little pamphlet where you even memorize that script and say the things that you think your child would want to hear, they're not just going to hear your words. They're going to hear the inflection of your tone. They're going to hear the depth of feeling. We call it affect uh, in the realm of psychology. Uh, how sincere, how legitimate your words are. And you may say, well, I'll just be really, really serious about it. You know, man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. And one thing that you will not be able to mask to the discernment of your children, even if they're very young, is the fact that if your heart has not been freed from its own pain of your past, your words will fall on deaf ears. They may hear your words, but they will not receive the source from which it came. And that's a heart that's in bondage. That's why it's absolutely essential that you can't get the fullness of healing where that child will trust you and trust your emotions until you are free in your own life before moving forward with your children. They want this more than anything else. Some of you are experiencing the problem with external forces that are drawing your child away. You call it that bad group that uh, they're involved in. You have that situation where they uh, are doing things with a peer group that are unsavory, not healthy for them. And I will tell you this, that their heart, the heart of every child, is to want to have the connection, the communion, and the knittedness with mom and dad or their caregivers. But if they don't feel it's possible or that you and I understand them at the level they need to be understood, it doesn't matter how many methods, how many uh, gimmicks, how many exciting opportunities you give them, you will only hold them for a small part of that time. And they will drift back to a place of people that will better understand them in their heart. So how is it you draw them from your heart? You cannot draw the heart of another person until your heart is free of its own pain. In other words, in order to put a message of heart to your precious son or daughter is to come from your own heart, and that is impossible to do unless your heart is healed and restored from its pain, from its affliction. So, you don't need to trust me on this but you do need to trust the living God in the person of Jesus Christ, your great physician, as we move forward. The first thing that we have a parent do, whether it be father or son, is select the child that he or she is going to go for the healing with. And you might say, well, I have three children. I have six children. How about we do it all at once? No. First of all, that gets very impersonable. And, and second of all, it suggests that you don't have a unique relationship with each child differently. You may love all of your children equally, but you love them differently because they're all different human beings, created with different personalities. Your interactions and your histories are uniquely different. Even if all the kids were part of interaction many times around the dinner table or on vacation or in particular events, you still interact with each one individually. And then you have the specific individual times that you can recall with that person, that child, in the process. That is why you are to write a masterpiece, Dad, to your son or your daughter in the hopes of drawing their heart on the basis of the things that you say. I'm going to speak to both Dad and Mom in what I'm about to say. And what I'm going to say is that in the letter writing, it is absolutely essential that you take accountability for your mistakes, your sins, and your violations in the relationship. It must include violations of intent and violations of default. You see, intentional violations are relatively easy to identify. Things that we said that really hurt that child. Things that we said in a way that we said it really hurt that child. Things that we failed to say when they needed to hear it from us. Maybe a, a, a script that said how much we love them or how proud we are because of what they have done.
How much we love them for who they are, not for what they do. I call that the difference between love for who the person is versus love of performance. And recognize that because of our fallen nature, we didn't do everything right. We tried to, we wanted to, but we came up short. And sometimes, particularly with Christian parents, who so struggle to do things right and fail to do the right thing when it comes to their heart. We become almost pharisaical with the religious spirit and all the expectations, many times having the perfect scripture for their behavior activity or what they've done or what they've experienced and go into teach mode virtually every time we're governing them never really feeling comfortable to get in feel mode where we can walk in their pain with them. Many of us came from a context that getting into a child's pain seemed an exercise in futility, a worthless thing to do, not going to fix their problem after all by walking in their pain. And I like to say it this way, it may not fix their problem, but it will fix them. And God's in the business of fixing them. He's in the business of fixing us on the inside. And you might say, what about their problem that they brought to me? What about the experience of the rebellion? And I say this, that we cannot force them to change. We can draw them from their folly to the foundation of truth. But we are far more effective in doing so by taking on the Spirit of the Lord in us where no man comes unto the Father except my spirit draw him. He is a drawing God, Father God. He draws us. He doesn't scold, he doesn't spank. I'm not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that you abdicate your role in disciplinary authority of, of your children, at least up to the age of adulthood and 18. Failure to properly discipline them, and the root of discipline is disciple, it includes rebuke and correction. It is not to be punitive, as much as people may think. It is never to be abusive. And that's a whole other series that I do on healthy and unhealthy authority for parents and anyone who has positional authority over their children. It is designed, though, to awaken them to that which is right and good and pure that draws them to your heart even when you discipline them. So parenting is not just expressed affection in the hopes of opening your children's heart for the love that you have for them. It's the purposeful intention to draw boundaries on their behavior and make it very clear that you love them too much when you have positional authority over them to let them hurt or destroy themselves and you will take action in their lives if you have to in those places where they may be exhibiting behaviors that place them at risk or someone else at risk or begin to violate home rule and become rebellious and stiff-necked against you and you have every right to take authority and you have every responsibility to take that authority. But how we did that and how we do that now has everything to do with the kind of relationship that we're generating for our future connection with them. The hope is that while you're not their friend when they're children, that you will be their best friend when they become adults. But we see so many situations where parents are struggling, not just with their children in the adolescent years, you know, 10 to 18, but the pre-adolescent years even. Some are struggling with great challenges of children from 10 all the way to the time they were born. They almost came into this world kicking and screaming. And we don't often realize that the impact of what may be happening in the marriage, even when the child is in the womb, has great impact upon their heart. That the symbiotic bond, that is the communion of the mother's soul and the child's soul, overlaps and knits while they're in the womb, whatever the mother is feeling, experiencing, both pleasure and pain, is something that is imprinted upon the heart of the child. Their mind will not recollect that because of how early in the formation stage they were, but their heart will have the imprint and they will operate in accordance with what's imprinted upon their heart, even if they can't recollect it or remember it. So. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. That's who he is. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Children will be a reflection of their peace as they come through life in their early years. They will be a reflection 
of the relationship and how much it was molded, developed, and poured into through the adolescent years into adulthood. That the adult years, even now, some of you are watching this and saying, my children are well born or grown and on their way, but you know what? My relationship doesn't seem that strong. And there's areas where I know my son or my daughter have issue with me or ouchie or there's certain things we can't talk about. Those are all good reasons for you to be watching so that you can begin the process of drawing their heart even years later. It's never too late. I had an experience of a man who was in his mid-70s. Obviously, just because of his age, he didn't have much life left. He was on multiple medications. And he came in weeping to admit the fact that he was a hard, abusive man that he had come up under that from his own father, not to give blame, but to give origin of his own wounds. And he had realized he had berated and took the value of life out of his own son in so many ways with his words and his actions and his abuse that his son had medicated with drugs and alcohol to the point that he was fighting addiction. Well, what God did in the reconciliation of that was so powerful that the last five years of that man's life were the best five years of his life. Because God can restore the years the locusts have eaten. Maybe a whole lot less time involved in the restoration years, but at, those, at that point, because of where he was at in his healing, he said, as Job would say, had said, I saw things too wonderful to behold in that relationship of restoration. That hope is there for you. That hope comes from the living God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I proclaim that hope, but it's on His authority that I give that hope to you. So as you realize that not only had you brought with you as a father or mother unhealed wounds that had become infected, and that I trust that if you're watching, you have already walked through season one of your own healing, and this would have been the season of your life before your children were even born. In most cases, I realize there are exceptions to that. Children are born to children these days at a, at a high level, that uh, mothers can be 14 and fathers can be 16, 17, even less. And that's rare, but it, it's happening. And I, I want us to realize that we're still struggling with our own woundedness and infectious behavior when we're, those children are born. But even in the early 20s, the mid-20s, and the 30s, when those children are born, if we haven't yet walked through our healing like I hadn't, I was a reflection of the pain that I did not heal. That's not to blame anyone in my childhood that hurt me with offenses and pain and things that they did and things that my dad failed to do and my mom wasn't able to do offenses not of just intention but the, by default then the sexual abuse that I experienced at the hands of a neighbor recognizing that there was so much uh, infection within my soul even after I became a believer at the age of 22 I knew I was cleansed from my sin and I had the promise of eternal life totally on the authority of what the Lord Jesus Christ did at Calvary, placing my faith in His shed blood. I knew I had the promise of heaven even though I didn't deserve any of that. Yet, even with that experience and wanting to feed on the Word of God and wanting to even do ministry and evangelize, I struggled with bitterness and anger and resentment and rage. And that was exploding out of me to the point that my wife and my son, my daughter, all experienced uh, times of how I had hurt them, how I had rejected them, how I had said things to them that made them feel as uh, they had no value or that, that they weren't important to me. And I was so focused on trying to be successful in my work because I had a fear of failure so many of the years of my life before healing that I put that failure, that sense of failure on them, and I laid my wife and children on the altar of sacrifice for the hope of a successful career and even ministry. It's led me to say that many men and women often hide out in ministry, looking to do that which is right, all the while failing to do the right thing, meaning that ministry is good. God calls us, but not to the exclusion or to the sacrifice of those most precious. God will always redeem the time. 
and allow everything to fit if we trust him first. But in woundedness, we trust in ourselves at the level of the wound. It's very important that I say these things so we realize that even without intention, in our wounded years, before we walk through to get healed from infectious areas, areas where we had a rejected heart and needed to prove to the world that we had value by being as, as successful as we could in all that we did, looking for medication of our soul through the adulation of those that said, nice job, good work, uh, you're really important to us, all good things that believers need to do with one another to affirm. But looking for the affirmation first from man rather than the affirmation of God, which was already there, and looking for the still small voice of God to say, to, to hear him say, which he was saying all along, I need you to look inside. I need you to see some things about yourself that I see. Things that others see but are afraid to tell you. Things that others see where they won't trust you. They may trust your integrity in action, but they won't trust your integrity of heart in emotion. If they can't trust your integrity of heart, they will not knit with you. These are things I knew nothing of. I was coming all from head, intellect. After all, get an education, get a vocation, get a career, be this, be that. I'm set. No, no, that's one dimension. Dimension of emotion and heart is where the healing, where the connection, communion, and the healing of the relationships are. And those are the very areas that where the pain is resides in our relationships with those in our second season of life. So you see, it's very, very important to make sure as you're walking through this, you haven't lost your reflection of when you looked back and when you looked in. Now you may say, well, I, if the second season is to deal with the here and now, my relationship with my children, uh, that's in the here and now, am I still looking back? I'm saying that only to make sure that you look in. After all, the real confusion about people in healing, and there's confusion in psychology, there's even confusion in the church. Do we look in the past? Do we uh, do anything about the past situation? Uh, aren't we to deal with the things that we're dealing with today and, and that we are to go forward and leave that which is in the past in the past? You know the verse, for the things set before you. Well, here's the part that's very, very important for us to understand. We don't look in the past to go back and live there, to find reasons or blame or vilify someone for why I'm a, I, I have been a wretch at certain points in my life in the present. We look in the past to find the source of the pain in my heart. Let me say that again. We look in the past to find the events that created the pain in my heart. How did the events create the pain? The events of being abandoned, of being rejected, of being abused, of being berated, of being controlled in wrong ways, create a soul response in me toward the offender, whoever I determine him or her to be. And in most cases, it's going to be the caregiver because they spend the most time with us and have the greatest influence. And after all, they have governing responsibility. Therefore, when I look back, I find out what may still be within. So really, what we're doing in that first season is looking within to see the very things that I was reacting to with my wife and with my children that was not very savory, was not very healthy, that was causing pain and conflict within them. So now as I move forward and do this first assignment, I'm still looking in and saying, ah, I'm condemned to repeat what I do not heal. And I have created through the generational iniquity the very thing in my son or daughter that I was under the power of as a child because I did not walk through the healing and let God heal me. But what about that person that created it? That, not the issue with them, as you have now learned by walking through season one. We only look back in the autobiography to find out the source of the pain and the who associated with the source. That is the person that I may hold responsible in my soul for hurting me or failing to help me when I needed it or not being there when I wanted them most. 
So I had to deal with the truth of the bitterness that my soul felt toward them. Until I did that toward my father, my mother, the neighbor that sexually abused me, not realizing it, I was extorting pain. That's a kind of a legal word where you take that which doesn't belong to you. You make someone else feel the pain. It's innocent people, people now in the context of my family, my wife and kids, to medicate, to salve the pain that I hadn't healed from the past. I don't even realize I'm doing it, but I'm responsible every bit the same. That the fact is, if you don't feel my pain, I'll make you feel my pain. That's my definition for vengeance. And that's what we do. Somebody hurts us and they don't recognize it or they don't receive or accept that they hurt us and, and make it right. We oftentimes want to make them feel what we felt. It's wrong. Pain for pain exchange, which so often happens in the home situation. Maybe our son did something to uh, uh, disobey or our daughter did something to disappoint. And then we go into a brood or we say something that makes them feel as if we don't care about them anymore. We, we certainly didn't stop caring, but now we're feeling as if they brought embarrassment to me or made me feel as if they're not respecting me. That takes me back to the wound as a child where I had my dignity taken or I was berated or I was abused and that person that wasn't respecting me either. So those two come together. Very, very important that you're continuing to look in as you acknowledge to your son or your daughter in this first letter to draw their heart. And it is not a letter that says this. It's a letter that says this of my personal accountability of how I've hurt you. Some of you, when you're hearing this, may be dealing with a situation where your child is dreaming up ways at night to make your life miserable. That he or she may actually trying to hurt you by saying, Dad, Mom, if you don't feel my pain, I'll make you feel my pain. And that is why it's doubly hard to take a letter and do an end run. Instead of one of these, you've done this, you've hurt me, and I've had to endure this, they're not going to receive it or hear it, even if you're correct and right. They're only going to receive a letter from you that acknowledges that as you look back and you write in this letter how much you really truly love them. Now be careful because if you speak in generalities, they'll just look at it and, and they'll be sarcastic. Yeah, right, of course. So you have to move right into the place where you speak into their heart and mind with the truth of what you remember happening during those early years. Now, there's going to be many things that you can't remember that hurt them that they can't forget. Let me say that again. There's going to be many things that you can't remember, but they can't forget. Because it impacted them. To you, it was maybe this big, but to them, it crushed them. And it might not have even been anything intentional on your part, but you hurt them big time. So what I want you to know is... When you write this, it has to include specificity and detail, not these general statements. I know I've hurt you. I'm sorry. I did my best. All of that will be nauseating to the ear and the heart. What you want to do is write the letter that you would love to have heard from your father and maybe never heard it if you're the father writing. If you're the mother writing, then write the letter to your son or daughter that you would have wanted to hear from your mother had she gotten real with how she had hurt you. And that's why it's only going to be effective for you to write this letter from the heart if your heart is free, having gone through the healing of season one, which is the year zero to about 18. That is when you transition out of the positional authority of your family of origin into the transition of your second season of life, adulthood. And, and you may or may not be married with these children, or you may have formerly been married, or you may be married. But both parents it is a very important 
since you have walked through that first healing, that you first, that you not only do the healing with your, uh, the marital healing, which is in part one of the series, but also the parent-child healing, even if your children are adults, even if they're in the pre-adolescent years. Yes, even five-year-olds. If you make the script age-appropriate, you can talk to them about the ways that you have hurt them. It is the universal language of all ages, even those cognitively challenged. I promise you in the authority of Jesus Christ, the heart has a wisdom that may never be fully, fully uh, appreciated or embraced within the mind, but the heart has a wisdom that the brain or the, the intellect can never have. And that's really where it's poured through. So I often like to say that true art that really engages people comes from heart. And at least in the English language, you find art, A-R-T, in heart, H-E-A-R-T. Textbooks from the mind will put you asleep, but a, a novel that goes through relational challenges of life and love and passion and, and recovery of relationship and healing, oh, that comes from heart. That's riveting. That's the kind of letter that you write. But you're incapable, and so am I, until our hearts are healed. You cannot speak a message from your heart until your heart is free to speak. Other than that, it will be a message from your head, and your child will know it right away. And no matter how much you try to script it as if it's from heart, they will hear it from head, particularly when you read it. And you say, oh, I have to read this. Absolutely. You must also create the echo. Echo off the walls of their heart after they leave your presence in your writing of this. Uh, it's good to have an advocate for the child in the reading so that they can feel protected in the process because you're putting yourself out there as Christ put himself on the cross. You're taking it on the chin much more than that. You're taking the hit for everyone. But after all, we're the spiritual head, first the father, then the mother. We are the ones that were here first. We are the ones that created the atmosphere of the home. And even if the father did more in the mother to antagonize everyone in the home, mother's inability to protect is regarded as a violation in the children. They won't quickly admit it, and they'll often protect mom, but the truth is they wonder why she tolerated it so long. So moms, if dad was the primary adjutant in the parental team, then... It's still important that you understand you're a part of that, at least complicit in it if you fail to stop it or pull them away for a season in separation. Complicit means that you really didn't agree with it or want it to happen, but you didn't stop it or couldn't. You felt you couldn't stop it, but you didn't take measures to get them out of there. Keep those things in mind. Now, it can be the other way around. Fathers can have the same situation where they placate mom in her rebellion and in her uh, mean-spirited nature and and her, the pain that she causes and not uh, facilitate the need for a counsel that needs to occur. So I want you to know that it's very, very important that the marital relationship from the time the children were born, even if it were dissolved at two or three, well, my child didn't remember that. I don't have to address that. Oh, absolutely. Even though they were not cognitively aware intellectually aware as much, the impact upon their heart was still there, and the knowledge historically that they're no longer with their biological father. Now, you're naturally going to say that the daughter has said, well, she hardly knew him, and she grew up with the stepfather or grew up with her mom, and things were, everything was good. I, I, they don't really know the pain that they haven't really experienced because they were a young age. Please trust God on this. There's still pain there because there's loss. That's not to shame anybody in those scenarios. That's to make sure you don't leave any stone unturned. And realize that when that child is ready, even in their adult years, to come to us or at least go to God with it to say that that has hurt me. Uh, and I recognize that I haven't trusted relationships for in my adult years simply because, or in my teenage years, because I'm still under the power of fear because of that situation that happened with my mother when I was only two or three, or even before I was born there was already a marital dis dissolution. What I'm trying to say is, anything that would impact that child when they're aware of their history needs to be addressed in the letter that you write historically. It's always good, dad, mom, to reflect first on the memory of when that child first became part of your home. Even if they're an adoptive child 
and you got them at two or three or six months or three months. What it meant when you took that treasure of that child into your home. And regardless of ethnicity and uh, differences there, to reflect what a treasure it was to choose them in the adoption. But also recognize this, that although I'm not going to address it at length, it's really going to be important that if they're adoptive children, to give them full liberty to write to the absent uh, natural parent, the biological parent who may never be known. And it's not about going to seek them out, although I, I think it's important to give any child at the appropriate age liberty to go seek and look for their roots, their history. Many of us would want to do that just to know what, what kind of uh, family they were with and uh, what they were able to do. Even if they're not successful, it's important to keep an open hand to that and an open mind to it. But the biggest issue is to take accountability for how you took them from that situation. I know it seems bizarre, again, speaking to adoptive uh, parents, that you would be the one that would be held accountable for that child's difficulty and challenges in life and those t tantrums that you may have experienced or those times of when bonding was so difficult and they seemed recoiled when they were taken from their mother, even if they don't remember. There's a recoiling of emotions because the symbiotic bond is so powerful while that mother carries that child to be taken as a rip. Oh, this is not in any way, in any way an indictment or a concern with adoption. Adoption is the most powerful ministry on earth, I believe, human adoption, because it is the most powerful ministry of heaven to earth, of Christ to us, because we are adopted into his family in the spiritual realm. Therefore, adoption is the one time the parent chooses the child powerful. However, knowing that should give you liberty to realize there's still going to be a wound of abandonment, a sense where the parent wasn't there, the parent did not keep them. And even though you are the true parent, the biological parent pain has a, a real impact upon that child. The impact of the, the adoptive parents are, is far more far more reaching once that child goes through healing than anything, any history of abandonment or being given up for adoption. I've heard many adoptive parents say that uh, oftentimes that they are the recipient of a child's anger from the rejecting arms that gave them up, even though they're the loving arms that took them in. Oftentimes, the adoptive parents, and you all know best that have adopted, and I'm not suggesting all of you had to experience this, but some of you I know have, that here you were in the rescue of that child, but the pain from being abandoned or given up came out on you, the loving arms that took them in, but that pain was to be reserved for the rejecting arms that gave them up. And to add insult to that, many of these children, as they learn more of their history, We'll talk about this grandiose sense of how the natural parents were and, and that they would rather have been with them and things of that nature. And I say to you, it's easy for me to say this, you've had to endure it, that if you love them through that, it's the most sacrificial love. And it's akin to what Christ did sacrificially for us at Calvary. Because the one wound that caused him to cry out was the wound of, heart rejection, not just from the people that he created that crucified him, but even more so from the father who turned his face away. He kept silent on all the other trauma and all the other abuse, and all the torture of the crucifixion. But when his father turned away, he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried with a loud voice, so recognize that these children will have that rejected heart in them. The heart of the father turned away in the presence also of the mother who gave them up. But once again, hallelujah for the mothers who gave them up for a life into your arms that took them in because such it was God's plan. There was pain there, but the fact that there's pain there doesn't mean it was wrong to be given up. 
The fact that there's pain there doesn't mean it was wrong, that you adopted them. Uh, it's, at times, I'm sure it feels like maybe we did the wrong thing. And that's how you know, above all, in this fallen world, that you did the right thing. And you continue to do that because you have an enduring heart. You have the heart of God that pursues after the one who's left the 99. These are the children of great promise and great prophecy over their lives. So look for great things as you continue in this journey. And this letter is so important because you can write both letters, adoptive parents. You can write your letter of how you've hurt them and not always been there for them. Father to son, father to daughter, mother to son, mother to daughter. But you can also write a letter as if it came from father, their father or mother. And that's for another presentation, but it's very powerful. I want you to know, though, the wisdom and anointing of God can fall upon you if you just ask. And he'll give you words that we would love to see because we'll, we will use the example poured through you because you're in, immersed in that ministry of adoption. So you don't have to wait for me to share with you my thoughts on that. You need not that this man teach you. You let the Holy Spirit bring that to you. Now back to all parents and natural parents. In this letter, it's very important. Specificity and detail. Reach into their heart and remember things that you did or failed to do. The time that I was at my daughter's soccer match and she kicked the ball and it went over the goal. She was one-on-one -on -one and I said, oh, she should have made that. Oh, what a horrible thing to say for a father to say to his daughter as she comes running off the field. Oh, my word. I'll never be relieved of the shame of that. But that was one event at one place, in one time, in one moment. Imagine what I don't know. Imagine what I don't remember. And think of this, what I can't remember, they can't forget. I wanna know what that is. Because all the while, I'm not remembering, and they're not forgetting. It is an invisible wedge between us that's causing division and separation. It's causing polarity. It's causing distance. They haven't stopped loving me. I haven't stopped loving them. But the expression of that love is hindered by this invisible wedge. Let's go after it. Let's pull that wedge out. Let's let the Lord come in there and put the bridge in for the wedge. Let's take accountability for what we've done. And you might be struggling with, you don't know what I'm going through today. This kid has put me through so much misery. I feel like my life is completely miserable because what my son and daughter is doing or what they're saying or what they're, they're expressing in the wrong way, oftentimes the pain that they've never got to be heard with. All the more reason to do this. What if it doesn't stop? It's still the right thing to do. What if it doesn't change anything? It's still the right thing to do. What if they get worse? It's still the right thing to do. Why? Because your accountability is first before God and then before them. It's God who will restore your soul. Even if they get worse, you get better. You actually become more and more healing. I have a great scriptural principle that when you take accountability for things that you have done to anyone, but we're talking about children here, there's an invisible weight that transfers from your shoulder it's that weight pressing down where Jesus said in John 11, Come unto me, all ye that, or Matthew 11, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We're heavy laden with all this guilt that we have, and sometimes false guilt for things that we've done, many times legitimate guilt. And if we express accountability to that person, and that can be anybody, someone at work, a friend, a, a person, our extended family, whatever it might be, and we express that invisible weight that's weighing us down, leaves. Guess where it goes? It goes on the one who has ought against us. Uh-huh. Why? Because it is inextricably tied. That weight on me is tied to the emotional violation in their soul. Oh, guess what? They already have a weight. Guess what their weight is? Resentment, bitterness, anger, maybe some hatred. Well, they already have that hate. They already have that weight. And my weight now is off of me, but it doesn't go off into the air. It goes and doubles their weight. Guess what that does? Puts them in a position 
where it breaks them. A broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart will you not despise. A broken heart and a broken spirit is a healthy thing. It's not always pleasant, but it leads to that which is most pleasant for that person and for the relationship that you have with them. This is such good news. So you see, come clean. Don't write in there that you did your best and if I offended you, you know what that sounds like. Imagine again that you're writing that letter, that that's what you would be hearing from your father or your mother in accountability. You'd say, oh, come on now. Well, I, I did the best. There's no, there's no handbook on parenting. Oh, I've heard that so many times. They know that. Oh, well, I did mean to do my best. They know that. I didn't mean to hurt you. They know that. Write the letter with all of that fluff out of there. It's like serving the turkey and there's no meat, just bones. That's not very appetizing, is it? Who wants to chew on a bone? Get rid of the bones. Give them the meat of the truth. I hurt you. I rejected you. I remember a time you were coming to me and you were hurting and I just shut you down and told you that's not even anything that, that is, is of importance. How, how could you even do that? Say to my son, my daughter, when she was upset and she would say something to me, I'd shut her down. What? Do, are they going to trust that? Well, you might say, well, it's not going to fix the problem. No. Remember what I said? It fixes them to walk in that pain. I am so sorry that happened. That we immediately give them one of life's lessons before we even get into the pain with them. That's an offense. I have to tell you, I did that way too many times. I gave them a wonderful life lesson. I became the perfect Pharisee. Yeah. Get out the book. Here's the scripture. Boom. And you might say, well, hey, listen, we're believers. We follow the scriptures. Do we? Or do we use the scriptures to hide our hearts. Follow the scriptures and there is a time to teach, but couldn't there be a time to feel and a time to heal that is followed immediately by time of teaching? Perfect. But if you teach only and get out or say, I'm not into this wounding with you, you say to them that they're not important to you, to your spouse or your children. You're not important enough for me to get into that pain with you. You're not important enough to be heard in this conversation. You're not important enough to speak what the solution is. Even if whatever it is they think is completely off the wall, hear it. I'm giving you the counsel that I never followed or knew or considered. I did everything that I thought was right when I was in my right mind without the rage and did everything wrong. I many times had the right motive, most of the time, definitely had the right motive. You do too. I just used the wrong method. And guess what? Right motive, wrong method, erodes the relationship. Your motive is never understood or never will be until the method is in line with a heart that wants to walk in their pain with them. Josh McDowell said it this way, rules without relationship lead to rebellion. You have got to look inside yourself, mom, dad, in a way that you have never looked before from the vantage point of the iniquity that you carried into the marriage before you walked through season one and realize that the very things that you experienced from your dad or your mother is probably the very things that your son and daughter is experiencing and struggling with right now at the hands of you. Therefore, you've got to be very honest in bringing forth that you have failed in so many ways. We hate to use that word, fail, because we think it's failure, but it isn't. Admitting that we have failed is the beginning of the most success you will ever have in your relationship with the person you admitted that to. And that goes with anyone you interact with. I failed. There's nothing more encouraging and more drawing to us in our leaders of this country that when they say, and maybe they really, really made a mistake and they say, I failed. We don't have leaders like that today in the, 
as many as we did. There are some, but they're few and far between now. And households don't have that kind of leadership either where we say, I have failed. Son, I have failed you. Let me begin to count the ways. We love the Shakespeare. Let me count the ways that I've loved you. No, let them do that. You and I got to count the ways that we have failed them. You say, well, how would I bring that up? I want to forget that. Well, that may work for you. That won't work for them. And it certainly won't work for the relationship. Do you really want anything to stand in the way? Think about it. The only thing that would keep you and I from doing that is ego and pride. Hmm. Ego, pride. So I'm going to embrace ego and pride more than I'm going to embrace my son or daughter. Hmm. Seems to me that's what Satan did when he said, I will five times. I will rise above the stars of God. I will rise up to the sides of the north when he was trying to take over the throne of God as the anointed cherub in Isaiah 14. I will. He was protecting his ego and his pride and look what it cost him. Nothing should cost us what we want, what the relationship with our son and daughter. Individually, one letter to each one and be specific. You remember the times. You know you do. Sometimes you might be very ashamed of. That's okay. Watch the shame disappear when you declare them. <laughs> it's gone. See, the enemy kicks up the shame meter when you're about ready to do this and thinks, I can't speak that. Oh, my word. It's amazing if you follow the truth of God and speak the truth in love, how much all of that dissipates. He doesn't want you to know that, though. But I tell you that on the authority of the Lord and the Scriptures. In writing that letter, then, you invite them in that letter to speak to you with a letter in return where they not just hand you, they read it out loud just as you wrote your letter out loud. And you invite them to be as specific and detailed as possible and try to arrange for an advocate. Could be your pastor, could be a, a good friend, trusted friend, it could be another family member that will truly provide advocacy to the child, whether they're an adult child or a teenage child or definitely an adolescent child. And you may say, well, no, I'm ready to receive this. I really am. And that might work and that might be good. But the, putting the advocate there specifically for the child shows that you're willing to take everything. When the child reads their letter and they're very specific and you may say, I don't remember it that way, don't even try to explain. Don't. Please, I'll tell you why. It is rare, if not ever, that whatever is spoken is not the truth of that person's heart. It may not be the truth of the actual event in every detail, but who cares? If the impact on that child's heart was this, and they scripted it this way, and you would have scripted it that way, who cares? Who cares? If you care too much about that, you will lose them. They will look at you and wanting to be right more than you want to be healed. So if you want to be right, rather than be healed. Now, if it is a blatant, historical issue of fact, wait. Don't bring it up then. Do not bring it up. If it's a blatant untruth and you have it supporting people to document that, that has to be dealt with separately long after the session unfolds. And you have to ask permission to comment on it. You might say, but they're believing a lie. They may very well be, but they've believed that lie for a long time. And you would ask the advocate, you would speak to the advocate. And you would ask for an opportunity to speak directly and that that child then can ask you any question about it. But if it's just the fine-tuning of details, it's foolish even to go there. Because the intent here and the end is intended to be the restoration of that relationship. At that point where that child then reads to you, you are to acknowledge full receipt of what they have said. And in most cases, it's going to be complete truth, even though it's going to be hard to hear. The hardest messages to hear when the child writes the letter and reads it to you and I are the most precious masterpieces that have ever gone forth. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think hearing that which you never really wanted to hear your child say about what you did or failed to do will actually increase the polarity 
or create greater destruction in the future. Uh uh. It is the greatest healing ointment. The fact that you listened, you received it, and you acknowledged it. They feel so vindicated and validated for the first time from one most precious. And the love that they always had for you and I is now elevated to a place where you become the greatest parent on earth of all time. If you could just believe that, you don't have to trust me on that. Trust the word of the Lord that when the truth of your heart goes forth, wisdom comes forth and healing. When the truth of their heart goes forth, wisdom and healing comes forth. At the end of that, and you receive that, it would be time to have the covenant. It's the parent-child covenant. But it's better to wait a time between both readings. I'm sorry, I got to the covenant too quickly. After the child has read and you've received all the pain that that child endured and you acknowledged it, ask for forgiveness, even though um, you need to give them time. Say, you don't have to acknowledge this now. These are things that have occurred many years in our relationship. Take your time on this and recognize that the forgiveness is not for me. It is for you, son, daughter, if you forgive me. Because I have asked forgiveness of God. I'm restored with God, but I now want to be restored with you. And that's the response that is best waited, maybe a couple of days a week and maybe longer that they need time to count the cost. What's the cost of forgiveness? Giving up my right of vengeance, giving up rights I really don't have anyway, picking up the battle axe that has been laid down by you and I and swinging it now in their direction, and they're, they're swinging it in our direction. So that time there is important. Then the child at that point will be ready to write their letter of accountability to you and I, acknowledging how they've dishonored us, disobeyed us, hurt us, maybe in some cases said things, did things that intentionally tried to undermine who we are and what we did and, and everything about our relationship. And I just want you to know that letting them do that and receiving it, it's important not to rescue them any more than they should rescue you in the previous letters. A lot of times children will rescue when a father and mother becomes very real and they start to break down, which is very good as the Lord brings sorrow and tears to us in, in the right reading of these letters, even sometimes in the writing. But don't rescue the child in their accountability because what we have to understand is if we've done wrong, we have lodged against us that weight of shame and guilt. The shame puts us under condemnation, even self-condemnation and condemnation of the devil. But true guilt is a conviction of the Holy Spirit and when we have an opportunity to uh, come clean, and that child is coming clean, they have an opportunity to be free of the guilt and shame. So it's not just for you to hear and be vindicated for what they did to hurt you. It's equally for them to be free of the guilt and condemnation. So I want all sides to know this, whether it be the marital exchange of healing after season one, whether it be the parent-child exchange of healing after season one, both sides benefit, not just the one, not just the one who is finally being vindicated for how they were treated. And then your letter receiving everything that they said, your letter, of, oh, I'm sorry, sharing with them everything that they did, how you were deeply hurt, how you felt as if no, there was, it was hopeless at times maybe and ever having that relationship with them as your son or daughter, how you so cherished a relationship, a friendship in their adult years. Now, not to be their friend so much in the, uh, in the uh, teenage years, or the pre-adolescent years, should it be the father, the mother, but later on, it's the opportunity to have a relationship closer, closer than anything you've ever known with your best friends. And in so doing, you acknowledge to them how they were hurt, so they, how you were hurt in the way that they dishonored you and rebelled and disobeyed and and took your dignity as a parent, let those words also echo off the walls of their heart. And then after that, and you can have a separate session for each of these, it could be four separate sessions. As a matter of fact, I really suggest that it is four, but you can combine 
the initial documents in the in the first session when you uh, write your letter of accountability and they have a responding letter but oftentimes it's better for the child to go off with your letter give it to them and draw from your letter in response but they will also be drawing from the recollection of their own history but after all the letter uh, writings and the disclosures the open vocal disclosures are finished then we do the covenant now some have asked well who should be in the disclosure of the letter should you let all the children in for the one brother when he and his father are going through the healing the rule of thumb is both parties should allow in whoever they want but they both have to agree therefore if dad wants mom in when he reads of accountability then his son should agree if it's to his son same uh, it, or it doesn't have to agree. If he doesn't agree, then mom isn't there. And if mom reads, the same with dad. If both parties agree. Very rarely have I seen a son or daughter exclude one of the parents, but it has happened, and we need to honor that. Same with siblings. Um, sometimes it's nice to have one of the siblings will have a brother or sister in there. Sometimes they'll feel the advocacy of it. That's fine. But the issues at hand are only to be the one who is the one who is the front and center with the healing. Let the other brother or sister that may be in there have their own time, separate, with any choices they have of having someone in there. Again, both should agree. So the covenant is on page 93 of the journal, and it's actually a forgiveness covenant, and it's between you and that party and any witnesses. It might be another family member, and we'll have this up in much clearer uh, picture uh, for you as you view this, but I want you to know that, uh, that this particular covenant is designed to have what's called an Ebenezer stone, which is a stone of remembrance. The Lord many times through the, the, uh, uh, the seasons of uh, the Old Testament of people's lives and kings and prophets and priests, etc., and families would have them stop, build an altar of remembrance, have them have a feast of remembrance or a stone of remembrance, an Ebenezer stone. And I, this covenant, when you both sign it, you have a remembrance when you look back that the last memory up until this point was how much you really were angry at that, your father, your mother, or your son or your daughter, for the, all the events that occurred, for the violations and pain for pain exchange that you experienced. But now when you look back, you go back as far as the signing of the forgiveness covenant. Nobody has to sign it, but it is an acknowledgement. If you don't sign it, that you withheld forgiveness. And that is between you and God. And if you do sign it, you are held accountable one another in the forgiveness decision, which is so important, so that we have allowed ourselves to acknowledge to each other that we have offended one another and that everything from here back is now released. But from here forward, we will keep the accounts small and be sure that we resolve them as they occur so that they don't build up as they had in our past. The last area, as I close this segment, is there may be others outside of your immediate family into your extended family. There may be neighbors, as in my case, where I wrote a letter to him in absentia for what he took from me in the sexual abuse and how I ask God to forgive me in that, and how I forgave him. There are people that you hardly, you only met one time, or you at, at work uh, had offended you, or you were a little child and someone had done something or taken something from you or uh, said something that really hurt you. Uh, maybe you had offended someone, maybe you had shoplifted somewhere, or you had taken something from a, a, another person at school or at work, or you had said something and gossiped about someone, whatever it might be, this is your opportunity to write whatever letters, however brief, but an acknowledgement that you make a covenant before God. And although it is not required to go see that person for your personal healing, God may urge you to go see some of them. And if he does, trust God that you may say, oh, I don't want to do that. If God wants you to do it, oh yeah, oh yeah, you want to do it. You don't know why on this side of it, but on the other side, you'll be telling us all why you did it. It'd be a great opportunity for God to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are right before him. So, 
Now that you've completed season one, you're ready for season two. And I trust in the name of Jesus Christ that he will restore the years the locusts have eaten.